Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nitu. It's so great to finally sit down with you and hear your story. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. This has been a long time coming. We did try before uh, the pandemic, but here we are. And I'm so, so excited to share what I know uh, with you and your listeners. Amazing. Well, before we get started, as always, I like to ask my guests this first question, which is how did you discover the plant-based or vegan lifestyle? Where did this lifestyle begin for you? I actually celebrated my 60th birthday this year, and I was born in India, in Calcutta, um, to parents of South Indian origin. And so I was vegetarian by birth, uh, partly by from caste and religion, but actually my parents were non-denominational and did not really subscribe to any religion. Uh, but my mother was an ethical objector, so she was very particular about uh, sort of the foods we ate. Uh, we did have dairy and um, I did occasionally try, uh, you know, animal products in my, um, with my, in my friends' houses. And my mother used to be very disappointed in me because uh, she felt I was not seeing the connection between uh, the sentient uh, beings, you know, the lamb and the goat that were tied outside uh, the butcher shop uh, seeing their, um, you know, sisters and brothers uh, having a terrible fate. And my excuse was, oh, but they're already dead. Um, and so I did occasionally try it until I went to medical school when um, what happens in India is that meat is often served in, in tiny pieces. Uh, so one doesn't really recognize the animal that it's come from. So I did eat uh, some chicken um, a few times uh, in my medical school career um, time in Pondicherry, uh, where uh, because my husband uh, or my boyfriend at that time and husband now uh, did eat some animal products um, and it was very expensive. So we might have eaten it a few times. I still didn't make the connection. And then I moved to the UK, I was pregnant with our second daughter. Uh, and we thought we'd come out for four years. Uh, I'd already specialized in uh, OBGYN. Uh, and I was really excited um, for my career. And when I was pregnant, I happened to see a couple of things happened uh, in my life, actually within the same week. The first, time, first thing that happened was I watched a program on BBC and they were showing sheep being shown in Australia. And I remember seeing the fear in the eyes of the sheep um, that really sort of stuck with me. And I thought, this doesn't feel right. Uh, and then the same week I thought I'd cook. Everybody had said, wow, you're going to uh, England and you're going to be eating, there's going to be so much of, you know, cheese and meat. You're so, so lucky. It's so cheap for her. And so I bought some mints. I'd never cooked meat in my life. And I bought some mints and I didn't know what to do with it. So I washed it <laughs> and I saw the blood running away. And I thought, oh my God, that's just like period blood. That's just like the blood when I deliver women and operate on them. And I immediately threw it in the bin and I decided that I'm never ever going to touch animal products again. Around that time, my brother in the US turned vegan and my mother subsequently followed as well. But I still didn't get the connection. You know, when anybody tells you too much or gets quite um, offensive about it, I think people tend to get defensive. And it was that was my situation. I just felt I was vegetarian. There was nothing wrong in having dairy. Uh, little did I know the connection between dairy and meat. And because, you know, my grandmother had cows in her um, house and they used to sleep with her. So I had seen that sort of relationship. Of course, now looking back, I know it's an exploitative relationship, just like a lot of women were exploited. You know, cows were exploited and bulls were exploited in the field. Uh, but I don't think my, my grandmother ever did that because she was so loving to them. She thought they were part of her family. She fed them before she ate herself and things. So it was around when my younger daughter turned nine or 10 and she came home having, she used to eat sausages and things in school. And she came home and said, mom, why did you not tell me all this um, before? And I said, I just want you to make your own mind up. She said, I'm turning vegan. Uh, and I said, but why are you turning vegan? Why can't you just go vegetarian? 
And um, she said, oh, you don't understand. White equals red. And I said, no, I don't understand. What are you trying to tell me? And she said, well, the dairy cow that gives us the, uh, the milk, which is white in color, she can't uh, stand often after a couple of years. And she then gets sent to the slaughterhouse. And that's why it becomes red meat. And for me, it was like a light bulb. All the stuff that I'd been told before had been completely had not made any impact on me. And this just that one sentence uh, from a nine, 10 year old made such a difference. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to change and follow what my daughter, because I wanted uh, my daughters, both of them to uh, be healthy and, and uh, nourished. And so I knew that I just couldn't feed them white bread and crisps because, you know, this is to be talking 22 years ago. There was nothing out there. And it was really quite hard being just being the only vegans that we knew. And, you know, when I look now and see, I, I just feel so happy that I have such a wonderful community, people like you in my life and, and a lot of other people that I met through social media. So when people go hard on social media, I say, uh -uh, don't knock it. <laughs> For me, it's been a lifesaver. Mm, Nitu, that's an amazing story. And it's so great to hear how this kind of positive and compassionate message trickled its way through your family. And it's happened in my family as well. Unfortunately, it hasn't reached my entire family. But, you know, it is something that has a powerful way of transforming people's view of our, us as human beings, but also the entire planet as well. And we could obviously talk at length about the compassionate Ahimsa part of, you know, veganism, but, you know, that's for another time. We want to focus on nutrition and health and medicine. Um, you know, you are an accomplished medical professional with an extensive practice. Tell us a little bit about what led you to medicine, uh, particularly gynecology uh, in particular. How did, how did that start for you? So my brother and sister were both doctors and um, I was actually very sporty and uh, but my father was a bit disappointed because in India they didn't have um, sports scholarships and things like that. And, you know, although I was competing at quite a high level. Uh, so when you're good in studies in India, uh, you know, 40 years ago, you basically did medicine, law, accountancy, engineer in that sort of order. My father was an engineer. My mother was a teacher. So I was very fortunate, I um, got into Pondicherry, which is a, a, a very competitive uh, medical school, a bit like the Oxbridge of UK. Uh, and uh, very, I was very happy. So I just went into medicine blindly, um, <laughs> you know, but for me, it was the perfect profession for me because I love communicating with people. And very soon I realized that I wanted to be a surgeon I also wanted to do medical stuff. I also loved the psychology aspect of it. And for me, there was no other speciality that fulfilled all those three wonderful things that uh, Ops and Gaini did. And 35 years down the line, I still find it just as thrilling. But what I realized over time was that there was something missing in my uh, toolbox. You know, I was helping women pregnant women after they had developed gestational diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy. I was helping women uh, with um, HIV and and before that actually I talked to them about safe sex and prevention. I was uh, treating people with endometriosis and polycystic ovaries and um, doing surgery and you know robotic hysterectomies and complex surgery before for endometrial womb cancer, for example, when actually lifestyle and, and diet would have played a big role at the same time so that I could tell them how they could stop from coming back again in the future with their problems, uh, hopefully, you know, by adopting a few things, which we never told patients that, you know, we just operated on them and then told them it's just bad luck and send them on their way. When actually there were things that they would ask us, is there anything we can do? And I'd say, no, 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 nothing you can do. So I realized something was missing. And even when I turned vegan, I did not understand the link between nutrition and, and health, even though I was feeling even more energetic than ever before. I had unfortunately uh, gone through premature ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause, under the, which is one in 100 under the age of 40, and I was 38, and I didn't know where to turn. Uh, this was just as I was becoming a consultant and I had no idea because it was the WHI study, the Million Women study, all that came out, the media press was so against HRT that 
I was not uh, offered that, but I also didn't know how to help myself. And despite actually eating whole food, plant-based foods, because that's what a vegan was in those days, and I was feeling so much better, my symptoms had improved so much, I still didn't put two and two together because the scientist in me, the doctor in me had never learned about nutrition. So it took me another 10 years to then discover that, my God, there's this mountain of scientific evidence that every aspect of women's health, and when I say women, I want to include anybody who identifies as a woman, uh, anybody who's assigned female at birth, however they may choose to identify. So I'm very, very clear about that. I'm very passionate about that when I use the word woman. And so I just felt that there is literally, everybody talks now about heart disease and type 2 diabetes and things, but hang on, what about menopause? What about polycystic ovary syndrome? What about endometriosis? What about breast cancer? What about all the cancers that have lifestyle um, related issues with them? What about you know mental health in, in uh, pregnancy as well as otherwise, period pain? There was so much and I was thinking, why are we not talking about sleep and stress and diet and, and things when all this information is out there? So I was a bit angry initially, a bit upset initially. And I thought, no, I've done that. I've been an angry vegan in the first few years. I don't want to be that person. I want to educate. I want to uh, do things. So I started uh, by setting up a voluntary service. I go into schools where I educate uh, children about nutrition and about safe sex and uh, how to manage stress and things but also for the public I felt that that was really important because I was using it every single day every time I saw a patient I never let them get up from their seat without giving them some resources or talking to them about how they can bring some further changes and not everybody wants to do it my idea was just to plant a seed I didn't want patients to necessarily go vegan it would be great if they did and many of them did do but what I was more interested is for them to understand the healing powers of plants, the healing power of sleep and stress. It's a domino effect that when you don't sleep well, you stress more. When you stress more, you reach for the alcohol, the cigarette, the, the uh, foods that don't bring joy and health to you. And then when you eat the foods that don't uh, energize you, you then tend to stress more, then you tend to sleep worse. And you tend to stay away from friends because you have a poor body image. So it's all linked. And this is what I was trying to bring to my patients. And my patients were like, wow, nobody's ever told us these things. They're so simple, but nobody tells us this. So that's why I felt I needed to talk to people on a larger scale uh, and, you know, try and bring this not a message. Sounds more like as if I'm, you know, but I wanted people just to be aware of, um, the information that I did not have access to at the age of 38, the information that I felt everybody should have. Uh, and then it's up to you as the person, you decide how much you want to do. Do you want to go 100% uh, plant-based? Do you want to go 80%? Do you want to go, do you, you know, are there situations in your life that you can change? Can you bring some positive things? Can you go for a walk? These sort of things. So I just felt that, that's what I have been put here for because I love every single thing that I do in Obs and Gaini. I find it so, so exciting. But, you know, this aspect of lifestyle medicine, so I retrained in it, um, not retrained, I trained in lifestyle medicine. I also wrote the first uh, women's health module for plant-based health professionals. The book is just coming out and I, I ran, run, um, I do the women's health module in the nutrition course just because for health professionals, just because I feel... This information is so, so important and we need to understand that, you know, we have to look after ourselves because once we look after ourselves, we feel more fulfilled. When we feel more fulfilled and satisfied, we then look and see what the earth is going on through and the sentient beings are going through. So I feel that it's all connected. It really is. Happy, healthy people is what we need in the world today. And, you know, thank you for sharing your story and your route and path to the particular type of medicine that you decided to choose. What's really interesting about doctors and, 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 and the medical profession is I think, you know, the wider public don't really realize that most doctors don't know everything. <laughs> and that when you go to your doctor, you know, there is this expectation that the person in the white coat with a stethoscope knows everything about everything to do with your body. But unless you specialize in a particular area, whether it's hormonal health or whether it's nutrition, you know, that doctor may not know 
very much about that subject and you know I've talked uh, at length recently with a young woman who uh, experienced early menopause and she went to her doctor and the doctor kind of poo-pooed the idea that she was going through menopause saying she was too young this is because the doctor she was speaking to was clearly inexperienced in uh, this area and so I think it's an important lesson to remember that our doctors are not perfect and that they don't know everything about everything. Uh, that being said, Dr. Google isn't something that you should necessarily <laughs> tap into straight away, that it's not you know, falling into this trap of like not trusting your doctor and going to Google isn't something we should be doing either. There has to be a happy medium, correct, right? Yes, Robbie. But what I always tell every single patient of mine and anybody who's listening is please remember that you should be your own advocate. You need to understand your own body. You need to know how your body works. One in four women don't know where their vagina is. One in two women don't know where their cervix is. And that is worrying because we are failing with public education, with sex education and things like that. So what is important is that one should always write down all your clinical symptoms you should know when your period starts, when it finishes, what problems you have, what bowel symptoms you have, what urinary symptoms you have, what medical history have you got that may be related and important. And yes, you can do your research. And I love my patients who have either um, stalked me uh, or have, uh, have actually read about their possible symptoms and they've written everything down because, you know, you have 10, 15, 20 minutes with your doctor. If you then start starting to think about what your problems are and you don't have your medical notes from before and things like that because that's all your property if you have all that information with you then it becomes much quicker and doctors do not know everything and in fact there are many conditions where the patient actually will educate you and there is no shame in that because there are the human body is mysterious it is very complex and it's so important that you may not know the answer you may not find a cause for the pain that does not mean the pain does not exist it just means that we as medical doctors are not able to find the exact cause and once people understand that that you know you're not being dismissed you are being actually supported then it becomes easier yes you may not get all the answers from your doctor and you often don't but it does not mean that you then start going down rabbit holes and taking supplements. And, and well, that's, this, this is my point. Um, I pers Let me just say, I personally have had fantastic experience with doctors. I was diagnosed with Durkheim's disease. Um, it's a pain-related and um, uh, tissue-related disease, yeah, quite rare. Uh, I did a lot of research. And when I went to my doctors and I spoke to them about it, they were very open. They, did, they were very clear that they didn't know much about it, yeah. that they would do research. So I've had great experience. But I know a lot of people people who have had issues, whether it's hormonal issues or um, uh, potential what concerns around cancer, have gone to their doctors and have been dismissed and then later found out that it was actually what they thought. However, I'd, I'd want to move the conversation on because obviously that's a, that's a big rabbit hole we could go down and I, I don't want to necessarily put like how doctors uh, address disease on, on trial here. It's more about like the, the important issues uh, that we face as communicators, you as a medical professional, me as a media professional and a journalist, one of the most important things that, that I like to address and we both share this passion is smashing myths. Um, false information, particularly medical information, travels around the internet at a rapid speed. You know, people read something on an Instagram post or hear um, a health advocate talk about something, um, you know, or a health influencer talk about something, and it then gets shared. You know, mum shares it to dad, dad shares it to grandma, and then all of a sudden the whole family are concerned about something that isn't a serious concern or it's totally false. What are some of the biggest myths around women's health, particularly, that you like to, to focus on and debunk? Like, what are the sort of key areas that you feel very passionate about making sure that enough people know the truth? I think the, the, probably the most important one is the myth about periods, that having painful periods or heavy periods uh, or not having periods is, is okay. It's not. So anything that affects the quality of your life, so any pain that stops you from working to your max or, um, you know, affecting, affects the quality of your life, makes you miss work or school or just doing things should never be ignored because there are many conditions that actually can be 
highlighted early on and managed much quicker. And that would be, those would be conditions like endometriosis, for example, where tissue similar to the lining of the womb sticks itself outside. Same thing with heavy periods. It might be because of fibroids. It might be that you have pelvic inflammatory disease causing congestion and, and, and heavy periods, painful periods. These are a painful sex. Another thing that, you know, it, sex has to be enjoyable. It should not be painful and it's not something to put up with. And so just because you are a woman and you have been used to minimizing yourself and not highlighting yourself to the doctors and that doctors are busy. And yes, we are busy, but we do, most doctors do want the best for their patients. Mm. And so you do want to bring in your partner and have these conversations that you should not be dismissed with because of painful periods, heavy periods. Are many women embarrassed to talk about these issues? They are embarrassed. They are embarrassed, but also they're often never asked. Mm. So periods are a vital sign. You know, if you are not on hormonal medication and you're having periods, then it's really important that you know and you track your cycles because missing periods, uh, and if you have delayed periods or cycle lengths that are outside of uh, 24 to 35 days, you may have conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome. You may be somebody who doesn't uh, hasn't kept up with your cervical screening. And so if you're having bleeding that is uh, after uh, intercourse or sex or in between your periods, that might be a big flag saying that there's something wrong, uh, especially cervical cancer. Cancer, which is a completely preventable cancer. So I, one of the myths is about periods and actually understanding how periods work. The second is about uh, hormonal contraception. I see a lot of people writing a lot of things against the contraceptive pill. And while, of course, we would love men to have uh, uh, the, the contraceptive pill, the truth is that the combined oral contraceptive pill has uh, many benefits that's outside contraception and that not everybody has the privilege of not using highly effective contraception. For some women, they cannot afford to get pregnant, whether it's financial, whether it's cultural, whether it is social, it doesn't matter. And for them, or if they have acne or excess hair growth that is associated with polycystic ovary syndrome is causing them great anxiety, then they, you know, the pill is something that they may have to take. And so it's important to individualize it, but also not make it out as often demonized in the wellness space. So I want people to know that there's not one size that fits all and that you should be aware that Western medicine and lifestyle medicine can go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. I know if you need, if you have a, a, a breast uh, tumor, if you have a medical condition, you know, a back issue or whatever, you might need injections. You uh, should have surgery if it's indicated. Uh, you may have to have take chemotherapy. You may have to take uh, hormone therapy for menopause. It doesn't matter, but that does not mean to say that you should not be looking after your diet or stress or sleep uh, or exercise at the same time. So this is the important thing that is not one or the other. And that's Again, something that I always try to break down that there is no medication shaming and there isn't everything you need to do, you do because it works best for you. Mm, absolutely. Um, yeah, such good advice. And, you know, I think one of the things I really want to pull out in the conversation previously, you just said is taking responsibility for your own body and, and understanding in a way and becoming aware of all its functions. Because, you know, as we age, things don't always function the way they should. And even they may not mal they may, may malfunction when we're young as well. Yes. And I think being ignorant of our body's functions is, uh, you know, it's a disservice to ourselves and our own wellness, because I think we should take responsibility for, you know, our, our good health. And that can start by what we eat. But before we go into that, I do want to sort of get your thoughts and, and talk a little bit more about body autonomy and, and women's health. Um, women's health, particularly in the US, has recently come under huge attack with the overturning of the Roe versus Wade um, decision in the US Supreme Court, which removed and has continued to remove the rights of women uh, for autonomy over their own bodies and, and really sort of enshrining in law the power for the state to uh, imprison women for um, having an abortion. Men are, are um, quite open and available to have, you know, various procedures, whether they're vasectomies or um, practice safe sex if they want to. But women are often, you know, when it comes to an unplanned pregnancy, they're the ones who are directly affected by being forced into this. So I'd just love to hear your thoughts a bit about this, because obviously in the UK, we're privileged enough for now to for, for, for this law 
to be protective of women's uh, sexual health. But in the US, this isn't the case. And we seem to be seeing an erosion, a continued erosion of the rights of women. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that and and a a comment from you about this this change in the law. Really, really, really makes me sad, Robbie, to see this happening in a higher income country. and I tell you this because I have seen, I having worked in India for years, I have seen the devastation. Although uh, abortion is legal in India, uh, I can never forget what shaped my career in, in many ways. Uh, I was an intern and a young law student, 18 year old came in and uh, she was actually, her blood pressure was unrecordable and she was cold and clammy, she was in shock. And um, I, as the most junior doctor had, while uh, people were resuscitating her, I had to put a catheter in and examine her. And I was shocked because as soon as I put my fingers in her vagina to examine it, because we knew she was pregnant uh, and she looked further gone than she was uh, in real life. What what had happened was she was carrying twins and her father had found out and had taken it for a backstreet uh, abortion because of the shame that she would bring to the family. Uh, and when I put my uh, fingers in the vagina, I could feel something slippery like, you know, worms and eels. And I, even though I had hardly had any medical experience, I knew straight away I was feeling bowel contents. And basically, the person had perforated her uterus and pulled out her bowel and it was completely necrosed, uh, which means it had gone gangrenous. And they worked on her for about eight or 10 hours and then we lost her. And I can never forget that situation. This was a, a bright young woman who's, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're bright or not, but this was somebody who had her whole life potential, her whole life ahead of her for no fault. And this is what's going to happen in the US. And I'm scared it might happen in our country as well, because of the fact that there is complete misunderstanding about what it is to actually, it's your body and understanding that you need to have full right over it is something that everybody needs to understand whether it's a woman who's standing and saying, no, no, what they're going through is wrong because this will only affect poor people, people from minority communities, people from disadvantaged backgrounds. All the others will manage to go and get whatever treatment they need, you know, privately or by paying money because those things will always happen, but it will drive a whole lot of things underground, online medications, dangerous bleeding, you're scared of going into jail. You know, if you have an ectopic pregnancy where the pregnancy has no future, even that is not being allowed. I mean, what happens if you actually, you you can, you will die. That That's what happens with ectopic pregnancies. I've seen a woman being sent away, not once, but three times because it misdiagnosed her. And if you have an ectopic pregnancy and that ruptures, and then you can die within minutes, within hours. And pregnancy itself is such a dangerous uh, situation that, you know, you can't just dismiss this. For some people, it's just not an option. And whether it is an option or not, it is your choice. It is your choice. It should be nobody else's choice, you know. It does not matter what other people think. It's your body, whatever you might think privately, uh, it does not matter. It's the, the person, person's autonomy, person's body, you know, don't get involved with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such an interesting subject and also very emotionally charged very, as well. I feel, you, know? I, you know, it's it's been 40 years and I can still, I, I tell you. I, it inv- I, yeah, it involves emotion, it involves motherhood, it involves religion, it, it involves ethics, yes. uh, and it and involves biology, you know, yeah. and, and um, unfortunately, many in the conversation often are not well versed or, uh, you know, what's the word, really up to speed on all of the subjects to a, to a, to a, a suitable level really and i think a lot of people wade into the conversation without enough of an understanding particularly around biology exactly you know most preg- most abortions um in the us are something like 99 percent of them are done i think before like 11 weeks or something yes. like that they are Absolutely. before you know the, the 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 fetus is even really considered a, a living human being it's more sort of cells but then you know that then you know begins the conversation which 
is for another time, perhaps a more in depth philosophical conversation yes. about like when does life actually begin? Um, you know, and it actually does tap into you know the vegan conversation as well and the respect for all life because obviously there's a huge tension as well in the vegan community Absolutely. for those who believe that all life is precious and that actually if you're vegan then you should be against abortion. And so it's a very interesting philosophical philosophical discussion because you know the idea is that you know if you're vegan you believe in protecting all sentient life so why should you advocate for the the rights for people to end the sentient life of another so it's a very difficult thing but this is where gray areas come in right life isn't black and white yes but sure as a vegan you can advocate for yourself you decide what you want for yourself right. but don't put that options on somebody else's body that's mm. what's what is the issue that i have no i completely support somebody who says you know for me i can't have a termination it doesn't matter what it is I, and i have lots of patients i have you know counseled hundreds maybe thousands of women throughout my life you know for having a a, a, a termination or not having a termination it's a very individual choice and certainly as a vegan of course you are allowed to think that way and you can think any which way for yourself it just should not be extended to Mm-hmm. women and their bodies Absolutely. that is an important thing Moving on to the conversation around lifestyle medicine, your holistic approach combines traditional Western medicine with lifestyle medicine, which is largely an emerging field. They're becoming more and more prevalent nowadays. Reflecting back on your own education in the current state of the modern medicine, what is lifestyle medicine and what role does it play in providing a better care for your patients? So lifestyle medicine, if you want to define it as it was defined by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, it's basically an evidence-based practice where you use proven evidence and use therapeutic approaches to either prevent, treat, and in some cases reverse, you know, chronic illnesses or and medical conditions in, for some people. I don't like using the word reversal simply because um, if you go back to sleeping poorly or back to a stressful life or eating foods that don't nourish you and don't energize you, then it's likely that your type 2 diabetes or heart disease issues will come back. So it's basically a, a, a evidence-based practice using therapeutic approaches which help you to prevent. So hopefully if you have a genetic background where you might be somebody who's highly prone to type 2 diabetes, polycystic ovary syndrome, heart disease, you might start bringing in changes very as early, as soon as you've learned about it, but it's never too late either. So, um, you know, whenever you hear about these changes, you try to bring those changes in to try and prevent it. And if you are not able to, because you have so many overriding situations, not everybody can prevent everything through uh, eating the right way or sleeping the right way. In that situation, you may need medication, but also it will allow you to actually manage your blood pressure better. It will allow you to manage your menopause better. It will allow you to manage your uh, breast cancer better by actually, you know, exercising and sleeping better and stressing less and eating better. So it's not that you only want to do um, these lifestyle pillars are six lifestyle pillars, which are sleep, managing stress, exercise or physical movement, because exercise is structured uh, movement of your muscles, while physical movement is, you know, doing household work, gardening, walking and things like that. So exercise, sleep, stress management, avoiding risky substances, especially alcohol and smoking, both of which are class one carcinogens, uh, tobacco, I mean, and, and uh, alcohol. Even a single glass of wine after, uh, especially in the menopause, will increase breast cancer risk by 12%. Um, having a positive social network, having community. You know, Robbie, I just did a, a whole day of cooking demos and talks in a, in a temple uh, recently. And I was just so taken, blown away with the power of community, you know, that people really find it. And that's why I love the plant-based community because that it allows you to belong to something. So it's good to be able to belong to something, uh, to have that purpose, to do charity work, to do community work. So positive social network, sleep, stress, exercise, uh, plant-based nutrition, particularly, you know, uh, and avoiding risky substances. These are the six lifestyle pillars and they can help you prevent, manage, treat 
and in sometimes put it into remission many of your uh, medical conditions but you may need medic uh, western medicine and lifestyle medicine uh, advocates are very clear that western medicine uh, and sometimes things like acupuncture and all that can go all hand in hand it is not one or the other if we know that this lifestyle can for most cases halt and as you say sometimes reverse some of the leading killers of human beings why is it not the default diet being prescribed by by health professionals across our country or the world for that matter if there's so much data out there and we and there appears to be why is it seem why does it seem like we're still in an uphill battle to convince people that if we want to reduce the huge burden on the NHS when it comes to you know diabetes, type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease, that we should be encouraging people very strongly to move on to a plant based diet. It just it just does, there just seems to be a huge disconnect. Why do you think that is? Um, for several reasons, I think uh, most health professionals are not aware have been ignorant about the power of lifestyle for most of their careers because we are not taught that in medical school, we're not taught that in our residency, and we're not taught that later. It's now slightly changing, but it's, we've still got a long way to go. Plus, there is the power of industry. Okay, Industry works very closely with politics and with funding, and so it is important to understand that you as an individual are trying to really fight the big brothers out there that are you know animal industry uh, agriculture industry uh, the uh, junk food industry the tobacco industry and people have learned a lot from um, the tobacco smoking because we knew that it caused cancer for years and years and years and years uh, but it took 50 years it, it probably took just about 10 years ago that we stopped people from smoking in public so mm. and nine thousand studies by yeah, the uh yeah. the in the right. united so, states for them exactly. to publicly say exactly. so so you can see that the alcohol industry and all the other industries have learned very quickly how to dodge these things mm. and when you put confusion uh, then it becomes so you know nobody's telling of course it's great if you can do a hundred percent plant-based diet but every step to eating whole plant foods is is a health benefit now but there is no money to be made from eating soya beans or uh, you know broccoli. dr gregor says there's no broccoli lobby <laughs> correct so what happens is that as a result, people get confused. The media don't want to bang the same drum. They don't want to keep telling you eat plants because that's boring. So one day they'll tell you to go on a paleo diet. One day they'll tell you to eat a carnivore diet. One day they'll tell you to eat a plant-based diet. And they'll basically confuse everybody. And so what happens then is there's this wide open field for all these big industries with a lot of money to dive in there and confuse people even more. So I'm not surprised uh, because there's a lot of money at stake. There's a lot of power at stake here. So all I want to do as an individual, rather than lose hope, because I feel that I don't want to be in that place. I want to make that difference. I want to look back uh, when I <laughs> lie down, hopefully at the age of 110, like a blue zone person, uh, <laughs> you know, that I did my bit. I did my bit for the planet. I did my bit for reducing animal suffering. And I did my bit for the most important group of people, my patients and, and the public, so that, you know, children and adults can live, hopefully, the best life that they can hope to achieve. And it may not be your life or my life. Everybody is different. And it doesn't have to be that you compare yourself with anybody else. What can you do to make your life more better? How can you bring more color onto your plate? How can you get up and stretch for a little while? How can you go for a walk in the nearest park that you have? Those are the things that I want people to think. I, if you're eating one fruit today, can you eat two fruits? If you um, you know um, walk around for 10 minutes, can you make it 15 minutes? That's all I want people to do. I don't want you to run a marathon. I don't want you to eat- Incremental the changes, right? Yes, small changes, that's all. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, some great advice there. And I think, you know, one of the most important things as well is is supporting organizations that are out there advocating for this lifestyle. Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM in the United States, here in the UK, uh, the plant-based health professionals. There are a lot of organizations that are out there as trained medical professionals that are 
um, I don't want to say pushing this message because it makes it sound religious, but they are, are they advocating for this lifestyle in a really rational and scientific way. So please do support both these organizations. We'll put the links to both of them in the show notes. Thank now, you. I'd like to go back to talk about endometriosis because obviously it's an, uh, it is a condition that often goes undiagnosed for years, yeah. sometimes on average of seven years I've read. Yeah. Um, many women are affected, um, including uh, in ways that are including painful periods and uh, pain during sex what are some of the other signs that women can look out for and uh, what should they be discussing with their physician to receive the appropriate care for this condition you're right robbie endometriosis does take an average of 6.7 years uh, and so some people may take 10 years for example to be diagnosed and this is because uh, painful periods especially in minority communities and and things have been um, and generally I, I would say painful periods are often dismissed as normal as part of that's that's what it's meant to be but any period pain that actually affects the quality of your life that lasts longer than you think it should be or is getting worse uh, it's best not to uh, ignore it because it might be one of the early symptoms of um, a condition like endometriosis now endometriosis is where the lining of the womb grows outside and for some reason it can be found in the lungs in the nose on, on cesarean section scars and it can be found inside your pelvic cavity and causing scarring and uh, adhesions and so last night I did a really complicated case as well, um, you know, where you have to actually unstick everything uh, together, uh, unstick everything from sticking together, the ovaries stuck to the back of the um, womb or to the bowel. So you can have painful um, and defecation, which means when you open your bowels, you might have pain, especially during your periods. You may pass blood. You may have urinary symptoms. You may have fatigue. You may have chronic um, stress. And I remember a patient of mine telling me, and I'll never forget that. And in fact, I wrote a Huffington Post blog on it. She says, Dr. Bajikal, um, I feel that, you know, when I, I have endometriosis and then I look normal from outside and I feel that my fate is worse than cancer. I feel people are not sympathetic at work. They don't understand the chronic pain that I'm in, the chronic st uh, fatigue that I'm in, and I can't have sex. I'm not able to get pregnant. So infertility is another uh, situation that some women may uh, find themselves in. And there are different grades of endometriosis, different uh, uh, grades of symptoms, but there is no one treatment. And the diagnosis depends on a specialist like myself putting a camera down your belly button called a, laparosco a laparoscopy, which allows me to examine the insides and then treat um, where necessary. But you can see it's an intrusive procedure. So that mm -hmm. is another reason why it takes time. And it also then mimics this broad umbrella-like term called irritable bowel syndrome or pelvic inflammatory disease. But the truth is that if you actually take a detailed history and you are very careful with uh, talking and listening to your patient, you should be able to come to a diagnosis. But as I said, I want my um, your listeners and my patients to actually advocate for themselves and not take no for an answer unless they actually feel reassured uh, by a trusted individual. There are lots of doctors who are empathetic, but are, who are also very good and will not dismiss you just because. So endometriosis is something that can last even into menopause and, and can make symptoms worse if you happen to go on menopause therapy. Uh, and so there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot, lot of issues, um, especially in Asian and black communities. Women are less diagnosed because, again, they feel uh, scared to go into the hospital to be mm. actually checked out. Uh, people who live in larger bodies find it harder. That's why, you know, we wrote out. I was going to write a book actually initially on endometriosis, but decided to write on polycystic ovary syndrome, which is because it's the commonest uh, endocrine and hormonal condition. But the reason I did that was because a lot of women live in larger bodies, a lot of stigma from infertility, acne, uh, as in an uh, in your adulthood, excess uh, hair growth where you don't want it on your face and things, losing your hair on the top of your head, insulin resistance. All these symptoms really stigmatize um, people. And as a result, they have a lot of anxiety and depression. So these Hormonal health conditions, endometriosis, fibroids, which are lumps of benign growths, these can all cause heavy periods, painful periods, uh, and, and difficulty with conceiving if that's what you want to, uh, you know, if you want to have a, a family. So I think if you are not on top of understanding your body, it's very hard. Nobody knows your body better than you. Nobody is actually more invested uh, in your body, not your doctor, not your uh, partner, nobody. So if you don't understand it, 
it's very hard to communicate that to a health professional to, for them to take you seriously because for a lot of people it might be that they just have to see you they suggest a few things but you may have to ask for an ultrasound scan you may have to ask for a laparoscopy you may have to ask for certain tests and that's why i spend a lot of time on my website uh, you know if you just put my name down if you put it in show notes i have about 50 different fact sheets uh, which really they're all free you can download them you can read them and there are resources at the end because i really I'm so passionate about feeling that I want men and women to really take charge of their own health and advocate for themselves because I think we don't get the chance to do that. We're not taught to do that. Mm, absolutely. Some good advice there again, as always. Um, you have said hormonal health is often undiagnosed, untreated and stigmatized. In your career, you've helped thousands of people manage their hormonal and reproductive health. Um, in particular, obviously, we've talked about PCOS. You've got a fantastic book about PCOS that you've written with your daughter, Rohini. Tell us a bit more in brief about this condition. It's obviously, uh, you know, a lot can be said about it. But firstly, like, what is it? Is it how common is it? Um, and what can be done about it? You know, th does lifestyle medicine help with this type of condition? And what can women do uh, to start moving towards a road towards a recovery or at least some kind of um, support? from their doctors or their families. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, so polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS or PCOS or PCOD, they're all the same thing. What essentially it is, is it imagine it to be a cousin of type 2 diabetes. So that is the best way to think of it. It's the most common endocrine disorder that affects women in the reproductive age group. So from the ages of, say, when you start your period anytime after the age of eight, up to 50, but it still spills into menopause. So it's the most common hormonal uh, disorder, the most common endocrine disorder that affects women. Uh, and so it affects one in 10 women, but we know that there are certain um, backgrounds, those who are struggling to conceive, those who live in larger bodies, those who are from Asian backgrounds, that incidence might be one in four. So it is so common. In fact, $8 billion was spent in healthcare in the US last year uh, for, uh, problems related to PCOS. Basically, it was because of type 2 diabetic complications in pregnancy, as well as type 2 diabetes outside. Half the women who have PCOS will go on to develop type 2 diabetes by the time they're 40. So insulin resistance is one of the biggest drivers of this condition. So it may manifest with the most common and under, most commonly recognized symptom, missed periods or irregular periods. So if your periods are coming regularly, um, then you know, that's a good sign. While if your periods come sometime at 37 days, 40 days, 45 days, you miss two or three cycles, that may be a good sign that actually you may have an underlying hormonal imbalance or uh, underlying hormonal disorder. But PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to rule out things like eating disorders, exercising too much, uh, and many other conditions. But Polycystic ovary syndrome is the most common hormonal disorder, is the most common cause of infertility in women as well. So you can see that women may have missed periods or irregular periods. They may have cystic acne and other signs of androgen excess, which is androgens are like testosterone. All women, all men have testosterone, but sometimes it can go into a little bit of imbalance. And so you can have acne, excess hair growth, as well as loss of hair. Those are signs of androgen excess. And sometimes ultrasound scans may show this sort of pearl-like appearance, that, which is why it's got the wrong name called polycystic ovary syndrome. Actually, there are no cysts in the ovaries. These are empty, immature egg follicles. So I was going to ask about that because yeah. obviously poly, poly means many, many. cystic cysts, yeah. ovarian. So you would assume that there were multiple cysts forming around yeah. ovary, the, the yeah. ovaries themselves. So what is the actual what is the actual sort of like biology of the condition itself? Yeah, so there are no cysts. Cysts are fluid filled um, follicles that women have and they come and go once a month often or you may have pathological cysts like cysts that contain hair and teeth or endometriotic chocolate cysts and things like that. These are just immature egg follicles. So imagine there's a big safe with a lot of eggs in it. We are already born with a number of eggs and every month there is a race to the top. Uh, some of the eggs are released out of that safe and one of them gets selected to be the queen bee and gets released and gets uh, ovulation occurs. And then when pregnancy doesn't occur, then a period occurs two weeks later. So, but what happens in polycystic ovaries, this egg doesn't get selected, doesn't get released. So there's a bunch of these immature egg follicles when in some women, when you scan them in adulthood, they may appear like your pearl necklace or a rosary appearance. And it's got that name. So there was a lot of talk about changing it to metabolic 
metabolic reproductive syndrome because men also can get characteristics of PCOS. And there was a big study of 172,000 men in uh, an Oxford study in the UK, which looked at men who have uh, you know, loss of hair from the front of their heads. They have increased waist size, high triglycerides and uh, high cholesterol levels, as well as type 2 diabetes. They may have sisters and and daughters who may actually have uh, PCOS. So these things can run in families. And so it's an important marker to understand that. And also this then showed us that PCOS is not a disease of the ovaries. People often think, oh my God, I'm never going to get pregnant. I can't sort this out because my ovaries are diseased. No, there's nothing wrong with these egg containing baskets. It's an endocrine problem. There's a messenger problem here. You know, the, the signals that are being sent by your brain to the ovary have been dis disrupted. So what you have to do all international guidelines agree that behavioral changes and diet and lifestyle changes are the first line of management, which means exercise, diet, and actually not um, having weight loss as a goal, but trying to have health goals so that you shed a little bit of weight because eight out of 10 people will carry some excess weight and just dropping that weight will lower the estrogen levels and help you ovulate and things like that. The drawback and the reason we wrote our book was because they then the patients in those committees said hang on you're telling us about lifestyle you're telling us about diet but you're not telling us what to eat so what happens is they say have a healthy diet now your idea of a healthy diet robbie may be very different from mine may be very different from my neighbors so that's why because the evidence is very strong for type 2 diabetes and because it's such a close cousin and because i've seen so much of benefit in my patients i recommend trying to edge as close as possible to eating whole plant foods by that i mean a lot of beans a lot of legumes a lot of soya which has got the healthy plant estrogens a lot of fruit a lot of green leafy vegetables herbs spices nuts seeds intact whole grains uh, you know these are should be the cornerstone your plate should be filled with color uh, and delicious flavorsome food so that you actually find that your inflammation levels drop you stay away from ultra processed foods that actually fuel the inflammation you stay away from animal derived foods that fuel the high levels of estrogen and so by doing that by exercising you tend to find that your symptoms improve hugely while exercise and, and diet play a big role, behavioral changes also play a very big role because anxiety, depression, uh, OCD symptoms, suicidal thoughts, um, sexual dysfunction, these are all parts uh, recognized in uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. And so it's so important to understand that talking, give, feeding yourself words of self-care and mm. self-love is so important. Always talk to yourself, I tell my patients, and those who are reading the book, talk to yourself as you would talk to your best friend. If you would not say those words to your best friend or somebody who you really love, then don't say it to yourself because that will just take you back steps rather than take you forward. And medication may be needed. You may need drugs like inofolic acid. You may need some supplements. You may need the pill. You may need metformin. You may need fertility treatment. There's no shame in that. But don't ignore diet and lifestyle because that will help you not just now, but for the years ahead. In the vegan community and obviously outside the vegan community and the plant-based community, there is a, a lot of myths surrounding soy. You touched on it there in your description about what we should be eating. There's a lot of criticism suggesting that soy is high in estrogens, that it's going to damage our reproductive system, that it's going to cause gynecomastia in men, which is also known as man boobs, that it's going to imbalance our hormones generally, that it's made of plastic, that it's highly um, what's the word engineered and that we should avoid it at all costs. We shouldn't eat it if we're experiencing uh, breast cancer. What is the facts and what is the reality around this interesting little bean? Because it causes so much controversy. Whenever we mention it on PBN, eat soy, eat tofu, we are bombarded by a barrage of people <laughs> who, who want to tell us that uh, we shouldn't be eating it because it's going to make us sick. What's, what are the facts, Dr. Nitu? So the facts are so strong that I actually have a whole chapter dedicated in my book and I have a whole fact sheet on my website. Soya is safe, study after study after study, thousands of studies, thousands of papers every year confirm how safe it is. 
Why? Because it is a bean. It's a legume. Uh, and it was discovered uh, about 5,000 years ago or so in China. It's been a part of a staple uh, of all the Southeast Asian countries for years and years. There is, it has no negative effect on uh, men or female, male or female reproductive health. That is really important to understand. It, the reason it gets so it's a very, very good source. You may choose not to eat soy and that's your prerogative. But only three to four people uh, out of a thousand may be sensitive or allergic to soy. And that will they often tend to grow out of unlike two out of uh, or three out of a hundred in dairy. So with dairy. So it's important to understand that soy is very rich in fiber. It has got all the essential amino acids um, um uh, arranged in a way that is similar to the animal derived foods so for example egg white but has none of the nasties that come with animal derived foods so it's important to understand it's rich in protein it's a rich source of fiber micronutrients vitamins but it also has something called isoflavones isoflavones are plant estrogens that have very little uh, mimic they mimic the activity of of mammalian estrogen that our body produces or is present in meat and chicken and things but it also has uh, something called an estrogen blocking effect. So it's very clever. What it does is in the bones, it needs to promote uh, activity. So it reduces uh, um, osteoporosis and promotes bone strength. Nice studies to show that. Uh, while in the breast, if you have too much of excess mammalian estrogen, it will block those receptors. So you reduce your risk of breast cancer. It reduces the risk of colorectal cancer bow uh, or bowel cancer, ovarian cancer, liver cancer, prostate cancer by 25%. So it's really important to understand that the earlier you start uh, eating soy products, uh, which is usually uh, minimally processed soy products are better for you. So soy milk, edamame beans, soy yogurt, tofu, tempeh, miso, natto, those are the sort of foods you want to bring in about two to four portions as an adult in your, uh, depending on the level of activity that you have. So for example, I would eat about four portions uh, where I have a handful of tofu, I would have, uh, you know, a handful of edamame beans, either in my salad and things like that. Plus I have a cup of soy milk and uh, on my porridge along with flaxseed and things. So isoflavones are found in flaxseed powder, which also we know reduces the risk of breast cancer. We know that isoflavones are found in berries, in bran, in cereals. Uh, so it's not that it's unique to soy. It's just that it has this very interesting way of a called a CIRM activity, selective estrogen receptor modulator. So that is why it is so wonderful and actually denying ourselves that, that bean. And the reason why the animal agriculture industry is knocking down all the rainforests, you know, most of the soy that is produced is sadly used for biofuel and for feeding uh, animals because it's such a rich protein source, rich fiber source. So they know that. And so what is important to understand is only 6% of soy is actually used for human consumption. And the UK Roundtable of Sustainable Soy is very particular where the soy comes from. And, uh, you know, if it is genetically modified foods actually are not dangerous. Everything that we are eating nowadays is genetically modified. Otherwise, you couldn't eat your wheat or anything because it will all get destroyed by pests. But actually, all the soy that comes is not genetically modified. It comes from the Asian countries and it's something that you should include in your diet. Even if you have thyroid issues, you just have to take your thyroxin medication a couple of hours separate from your soy. If, even if you have a history of breast cancer, because we know that those uh, this, a nice study showed that when you are on medication for breast cancer and you're trying to reduce that breast cancer from coming back, those who actually ate more soy products actually had a significant, I think something like a 20-30% reduction in mortality from the breast cancer coming back. So it's so important to understand that it should form part of a varied diet, whether you're 100% vegan or not. Soy is a very important source, especially for children and for people who are growing older, uh, because you need more protein and you need good protein sources. And that is tofu, tempeh, edamame, mature soybeans. In fact, Neil Barnard from PCRM did a wonderful study where half a cup of mature soybeans, if you eat every day, you get about I think 50 milligrams of isoflavones, you can get it from other things like edamame beans, tofu, and a cup of soy milk. But when you take that half a cup of mature soy beans, they found that the women had an 84% reduction, 84% reduction in hot flushes. Mm. 
Wow. That is amazing. Forget the mild flushes. This is moderate to severe flushes because not everybody can take hormone therapy. Not everybody can take hormone replacement therapy. One in seven of us will get a, a lifetime uh, diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, you know, some of us may have thrombosis, uh, history of thrombosis or strokes or clots or a very strong family history, or we may choose not to take HRT. So you should not be taking supplements of soy because that can actually it's nothing natural when it comes in a tablet so you're much better off always eating the whole plant foods so don't just reject it because somebody that you've uh, read who doesn't have the science or the experience talking about soy being bad for you you know read the science because you're otherwise denying yourself a very very healthy food really healthy Mm, definitely such a great message there and there's a a huge array of amazing plant-based products that are soy based which will give you plenty of protein Uh, and as i always say to people if you are going to have processed food in any form whether it's uh, vegan or not you know we want to make sure it has low levels of nice easy salt oil and sugar Um, (laughs) sos save your soul (laughs) save our souls Uh, you know we we really want to eat our foods in their most natural forms Uh, also that fermented foods are fantastic aren't they i'm a huge Yes. fan of tempeh which is a fermented form of Absolutely. soy bean and it does have a more processed in the sense of processed by the by the uh, i want to say the fungus yes. that is placed into the soy which actually uh, improves digestion yeah. um and it makes a delicious uh, vegan bacon alternative as well which i absolutely love so if you do I, I, you know there's nothing wrong in having the occasional burger the occasional uh, sausage because you do want to have joy in your life and that is important because when you go for uh, to friends houses you can have alternatives that are really very tasty and look similar to what other people are eating and then you can start a conversation so it can be used as foods in transition as well as treats and for older people and for younger children bringing in more protein through these uh, you know so-called processed uh, soy meats it's so important to understand that there is a balance in all this because soy is also very i forgot to mention it's very good for lowering your cholesterol helping you to lose weight as well as very good for heart disease especially the fermented types mm, absolutely yeah the, the plants uh the answer is in the plants it's the in our answer food. is in the plants um, you know <laughs> it's such a, an important message it's simple but it's a very important message and i think that's the trouble and the challenge that we face in the world today people are looking for quick fix solutions looking for a pill something instant but it takes time for our bodies to adjust and it takes time to resolve chronic illness. And so we have to be patient. Um, yes. We have to be patient, patients. Uh, yes. So thank you for this uh, fantastic conversation. My last question really is about the vegan movement. You know, it's a fundamentally um, a movement for empathy towards others and all living beings um, and particularly towards ourselves. Um, I think when we think about medicine, think about doctors, you know, sometimes there is a, a disconnect between the patient um, and the doctor in the sense of a connection, that kind of compassionate connection. Uh, doctors are coming under increasing pressure to get patients out the door quicker and quicker because there's just a lot of people and not enough doctors. And there isn't a time to have those relationships, those connections with people. Um, not everyone can afford to go private and have uh, you know, a kind of intimate connection with their doctor. But if there are any health professionals out there, medical professionals out there, practitioners, have you got any advice for them about how they should be connecting with their patients and how we can compassionately and kind of courageously encourage people to move towards a more healthy plant-based lifestyle because it isn't easy talking to people about what they eat often when you talk to people about about what they eat there is defensiveness there is um kind of you know shame attached to it um but what are your methods and how do you talk to people about this in a way that really resonates and connects with people from a heart center i suppose so I've been very fortunate, and so has my husband, Rajiv. We've been very fortunate in educating our colleagues in our department. Uh, but what I always tell people, um, my colleagues, and you know, I have been teaching in um, medical students and trainees and younger consultants for years, decades. I always say, treat people the way you would want to be treated. And it's likely because a lot of doctors might practice defensive medicine because they're scared of being sued. 
what I would always say is that if you actually practice medicine the way you or you would want a loved one of yours to be treated, you will almost never go wrong. You can make mistakes and you can have complications, but you should own up to those. You should be open about those because that will actually make you a much better human being, much better doctor, and you'll practice much better. And that's the uh, mantra that I have followed throughout my life. And I've been very blessed, very fortunate. I hope I will be until I stop practicing, which I hope is not going to be for a very, very long time. Um, the I also always say that, you know, follow the science, read the evidence, try it yourself, because it's very hard when you are smoking a cigarette to tell your patient to stop smoking. If you are somebody who does not exercise, how are you going to tell your patient to exercise? If you are somebody who's going to go and tuck into that uh, chicken curry, how are you going to tell somebody to eat less red meat and chicken, which is associated with, for example, endometriosis? We know that a very good nurses health study showed that. So all I want people to understand is that you want to adopt this because you have you may want to have children, you may want to have grandchildren, you want to leave a world for them, they will look back and say, you know what, my mom and dad did the best they could to leave me an earth where I could drink water, I could eat food, I could roam around without being, you know, burnt to a toast. So I really think that compassion has to start within yourself, with your patients, but also remembering that you know, there is no health indications to eat, continue eating in the standard Western way. There are so many health and joyful benefits from eating more plant foods. So try and start with small steps and increase them because then you will actually reap those benefits and the planet will reap the benefits and those animals that are suffering will also reap, reap the benefits. There is, it really is a win-win situation and that's the message I always try and give without judgment, because I think when you do put judgment onto people, they get defensive and they don't want to hear it. And also pointing people to resources. Some different resources appeal to different people. Uh, and so it's really important that you actually give that uh, resource so that people may just go away and say, you know what, that's a whole lot of rubbish Dr. Bajikal just said, or, <laughs> you know, Actually, there is a grain of truth. Maybe I can start making some changes for breakfast. Maybe I can start making some changes for lunch. So that's that's the way I have decided that it's going to be the way I work. Amazing. Some great advice again, as always. Uh, before I let you go, I always like to ask my guests this final question. If you were stuck on a desert island and it was just you and a pig, you're obviously not going to eat the pig because you're vegan. You know what's coming next. If I gave you one book, one vegan dish, and one music album or music artist, who would you take with you? Um, the book, I think, would be... Oh, I actually might take, um, you know, a book that is complete. It's about Muhammad Ali um, uh, because he's a big hero of mine. And so I would read anything that is about him or by him. Um my vegan dish would probably be um, a, a dosa, which is a South Indian pancake, a savory pancake. I could probably eat that uh, all my life or sticky toffee pudding, but I might find that a bit sickening after some time. <laughs> and what was the third question? The uh, Music artist. Music artist. Ooh. Mm. A lot of them, but I have to say very traditional, but... The Beatles would be, <laughs> never fails me to get up and start singing and dancing. Got a lot of nice memories for me uh, from my teenage romantic years with my husband. So, Dr. Neetu, thank you for joining us on the PBN podcast. It was a pleasure to sit down and hear your story. Thank you.